Okay, yes, uh, hello, well, okay, hello. So together with Jan, we are, talk, are going to talk about the problem of parsing shell, shell scripts. And uh, well, in my part, I would like to explain to you why we are interested in this problem. And then Jan will uh, explain to you what we have uh, experienced on our journey so far. Okay, so what, what, are, what we are doing is we are having a project, um, a research project over five years where we are trying to analyze Debian maintainer scripts. So Debian is part of the research project um, and it's uh, important that we have this application. So what are maintainer scripts? Most of you know what it is. These are pre-inst, post-inst, pre-RM, post-RM scripts which may exist in binary packages, you may have none of them, you may have all four of them, or just a combination of them. And we think it's very important to analyze the scripts that we have in these packages. Why? Well, the first thing is they are executed as root every time you install a package, you deinstall a package, or that you upgrade a package. And obviously, uh, Alex talked, uh, talked already uh, this morning about what's, what's happening when you are running on Elliot, any arbitrary shell code. Well, this stuff is executed as root on every machine where you have Debian installed. So obviously, we should be quite sure that these are not doing any stupid things. Uh, part of the problem is that, well, uh, these scripts might be executed in different contexts. And contexts mean uh, the collection of packages which are currently installed on your package, on your, on your machine. And what these scripts are doing might depend on stuff which currently is installed on your machine. This is part of the reason why these scripts exist at all, because they are parts of the stuff you cannot put into the package because they are not static. They depend on the particular situation of your machine. So are different situations, and in all situations, uh, scripts have to do the right thing and nothing, nothing wrong. Another uh, source of the problem is the fact that uh, the packages are not living in isolation, in isolated silos. We have packages which share infrastructure with other packages. Think, for instance, of tech, think of, um, uh, of Emacs, where once you install a package which contains, for instance, a tech add-on or an uh, Emacs, Emacs uh, macros, these are compiled or installed on directories which have been installed by other packages. So uh, packages do not live in isolation. And we think that we need automated tools uh, to analyze these scripts. This obviously cannot be done by hand alone. And uh, just to give you an idea about the kind of problems that we are intending, hoping, uh, that, uh, that we hope to be able to find automatically at the end of the project. I cannot promise that this will be the case. But if you are on the QA mailing list, maybe you remember this bug report. Uh, two months ago, uh, someone complained that he could not uninstall the sendmail base package because there was a bug in the post RM script. And uh, the thing I would like you to remark here is that this particular version of the package was in the archive for more than two months, and the bug is at so the bug is at least as old as that and probably older. And it's not really, well, Sendmail is not really a rare package. Uh, it has a popcorn of, the, of almost uh, 3,000. And one might wonder why this bug has not been found before and reported before. Because this, se this seems to be quite an, uh, an, uh, an obvious problem. And uh, the reason is that, in fact, the bug occurred only in a very particular situation. The situation was the following one. In fact, this was the offending line in the post-RM script. It was a find invocation with a uh, flag uh, minus size zero, and all the files found by this find invocation would be removed by the xargs minus r rm. So minus r is the option to xargs and not to rm. Uh, and in fact, obviously, the maintainer here was assuming that a directory can never be of size zero, because in that case, of course, the rm would fail. It would not remove a directory. And in fact, when you try it on your, on your machine, you probably, most of you have an uh, EXT file system. In fact, you will find that a directory always has a size of at least one block. So one can understand why one would make this assumption. However, it's not always true. And the unfortunate user who was uh, experiencing this bug, 
he was yet his ETC on a ButterFS file system, which is a kind of overlay file system with copy on write. And it turns out that on this particular file system, it is possible when you create a new directory that it has size zero. And this explains why two months after the package was installed in the archive, he uh, uh, he dropped uh, on this on this particular bug, which of course once so someone found out what happened, what happened uh, was quite easy to find. So the point I would like to make here is that testing is not enough. So this you probably would not find. I think P uh, PyoParts has, has tried uh, had, had tried to install the package and to deinstall the package. Obviously, the, the bug was not found because it occurs only in a very very particular situation. Okay, so. We are trying to analyze the, uh, the maintainer scripts. So this is a kind of an old analysis I did uh, at the end of 2016. At that time, we had almost 32,000 maintainer scripts in the archive. At that time, we had already more than 50,000 binary packages. And the vast, vast majority of these are POSIX shell scripts. Well, there are about 300 bash scripts, which really have written bin bash. They probably should be POSIX shell anyway and a few Perl scripts, and even one ELF executable, but almost all of them are POSIX shell scripts. So at the beginning of, of our project, obviously, uh, the first uh, uh, building block of our tool chain would be to construct a front end, which would read the POSIX shell scripts, translate them into a syntax tree, and then we would use this as the first, front, uh, as the first building block in order to uh, have after this all the formal analysis stuff, which would be able to find the bugs. So our first step was to build this uh, parser. And at the beginning of the project, honestly, we thought that this would not be too difficult. So we expected to have the front end after maybe one year of the project with a nice specification of Unix commands and everything. And it turns, uh, turned out that it took us much longer than that. And the reason for that is, in fact, Jan, who will now explain to you why this was so difficult. Okay, so I'm going to pass this on. We don't have the same head, I think. No, it's good. Okay, does it work? Okay, cool. So thank you, Ralph, uh, to let them believe that they will uh, attend a regular technical talk so that they are confident and calm for the moment. Um, so as, uh, as uh, Ralph said, uh, the first goal of our project is to, uh, to, to write a POSIX shell parser. But as uh, this POSIX shell parser will be um, used, integrated into a static analyzer, uh, we really have uh, to be confident in, in, in this implementation. We have, we have to trust it, okay? Because otherwise, we can't trust the final results of the entire tool chain. So uh, the question that I will uh, talk about uh, during this talk is how to write a POSIX shell parser that you can trust. <laughs> but uh, actually, uh, the real message of this talk is that if you try to, uh, if you start answering this question, you will start a journey in a world which is not uh, different from hell. Okay, so I will try to explain why during this talk. Um, but let's start with the beginning. So when you know that you will have a, a difficult journey, uh, I I you, you first try to be prepared. So you open a book and you try to listen to, listen to the, uh, the wisdom of your ancestors. Because you know, uh, for 50 years, uh, uh, a lot of computer scientists study this problem of parsing, and they said to us a very important message. Uh, parsing is a very difficult uh, programming task sometimes. And as it is a difficult programming task, it has to be decomposed into simpler tasks. And they gave us a very beautiful architecture. Okay, the one that says, if you want to, to build a syntactic analy analyzer, you first start with a lexical analyzer, a lexer, which will turn your stream of characters into a stream of tokens, a stream of uh, what is really relevant in your input. And then you will write a parser that will take this uh, 
sequence of tokens and recognize some structure inside it using a grammar and build for you, if uh, the input is syntactically correct, uh, an abstract syntax tree. Okay? So that's uh, the beautiful architecture that I've been here for uh, uh, 50 years now. And it has been so, so well studied that actually people came with very nice declarative language that you, you know, lex specification and BNF specification. That helps you define lexical analy analysis and uh, pars parsers uh, with very declarative languages. And furthermore, what they gave us is a way to turn these very high level specifications into code. Just like when you use a compiler and you trust it to be able to turn your high level language into some, some assembly code, it is possible to only have to reason about these specifications and just let the code generators work, uh, do their work to give you uh, uh, code that you can trust. Okay, so it's a very beautiful framework and everyone wants to, uh, uh, when you have to define a compiler, you really want to use that one. So of course you start with the classical architecture and you go uh, in another book, uh, the POSIX shell specification, which is defined by the open group. And well, by just looking in a very high level way, you first discover a yak grammar inside. So it's a real moment of happiness. You say, oh, <laughs> the job is almost done. There is a yak grammar inside. So we'll uh, just have to cut and paste it into my code generators and then I will go uh, to holidays. But actually, it's not exactly a yak specification. It is a yak specification annotated by site conditions, which are actually totally uh, out of reach in terms of expressiveness uh, of what you can do, what you can recognize with LR parsers. So it means that you can't really use directly, at least, this uh, 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 YAC specification. Okay, so you, you have to enter the details to actually read the text, and then you understand more and more then actually the specifications is really low level. It is sometimes contradictory. It is unconventional. You've never seen that before. And also informal. Okay. So actually you can't really blame the, the guys that wrote uh, the specification, but because the actual truth is that the language itself is an absolute horror. Okay, it's, it's a monster, it's something, uh, it's a world of suffering. Okay, if you want to, to understand precisely what it is. Why? Well, I will explain that during this talk, but basically the idea is that lexical analysi analysis is passing dependent. So that you, could you, you can't see the, uh, the, the process as a composition of lexical analysis then passing, but actually there are interactions needed between the two. And uh, um, the grammar is actually ambiguous. And even in, in, in general uh, terms, in the general case, you can't write, it's undecidable to write a static parser for shell scripts. In addition to that, the, 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 the specifications is full of irregularities. You have a lot of special cases everywhere. So let's uh, try to give, I will try to give you some examples that what I've just said is true. And to start with, let's consider token recognition. So if you, have, if you are a compiler writer, you are used to a, a definition of lexical analysis in which tokens are defined positively. You are given a regular expression for identifiers for uh, keywords, f for keywords you have a, a list of, of the keywords. You, you also have, uh, I don't know, regular expressions for some literals and so on and so forth. So it's very nice because you can just cut and paste the regular expression into your Lex generator and use the common strongest mass, uh, longest match strategy of this Lex uh, tool 
to uh, define your lexical analysis. In Shell, it's totally different. It's the other way around. Tokens are not defined positively, but negatively in the sense that what you have is how to delimit your tokens. What are what is uh, uh, between each tokens? Okay, uh, that's not really difficult, but it's just unconventional. So unfortunately, what you can do is still to use uh, leg specification to define that, and uh, it kind of work. But there is another difficulty. Uh, normally, the lexical uh, analysis is uh, defined as, uh, as I've said, uh, a, a function that takes your characters and produces the tokens that will be consumed by the grammar. Grammar is expressed with these tokens. But actually, in the case of the shell specification, that's not true. What you have after lexic token recognitions is not really token. It's what I would call pre-tokens. Uh, it's, uh, it's a classification of a text chunk into two categories, words and operators. So you will have to do some post-processing to get actual token, but I will talk about that uh, later. Um, also, um, there are some easy parts normally in when you write a lexical analyzer. Typically, new lines, they are just ignored. Comments, they are easy. Escapes, or they are just, you know, a backslash and something else. In the case of shell scripts, it everything is complicated, even the semantics of new lines. I will come back on this using an example in a few minutes. But let's consider this example about token recognition. In any sane language, on the first line you would detect, I would say, five tokens. Okay? In the case of Shell, it's just one token. But okay, fine. It's how it is specified. Let's continue. Uh, in on line two, well, you have to separate token by considering space. So here you have a space, okay? Here you have another one, here you have, oh, wait, no, this one is between double quotes, so it's not a space that delimit tokens. Fine, fine. And you have another space, oh, here, no, it's not fine too, because here this space is uh, in a subshell here, so also it's not really, de it's not delimitating pre-tokens. So fine, it's not, it's not a space uh, that delimits. Here you have another space which delimits token and here no, uh, a final one. So it means that here you have actually five token. But okay, what I've just said, it means that uh, you have to write your lexical analysis by considering some form of context to, to define if a space is delimiting or not your, your tokens. But that's fine, you can do it. For the moment, it's just uh, complex lex specifications that you will get. By, by so it, w it means that if it is complex, it is not simple. And I really love to trust think or simple things, not complex ones. But OK, I will trust that part if I look at it very l for a very long time. But let's consider new line now. Actually, in the shell scripts, you have four different interpretation of new lines, four different interpretation of new lines. Uh, uh, repeat it again. Four different interpretation of new lines. It's totally crazy, okay? So let's consider this example. On, line uh, on the first line, for instance, you have a new line at the end of, uh, uh, of the line, and it is meaningful in terms of the grammar. It is uh, a token, actually, that, is, um, that appears in the grammar, so you have to convey it to the parser, and it is important. It is uh, delimit the, the tokens that uh, uh, end the, the sequence on which you are uh, iterating over. Uh, then, uh, of course, you have new lines in comments that must be ignored. You also have this new line preceded by backslash backslashes. That means that that's you are uh, uh, you have a line continuation. You know, it's just uh, a way to continue to the next line. So it's purely lexical. It it doesn't, the grammar is, is not uh, telling, uh, asking something about that. And, uh, and uh, finally, the backslash n at the end is an end of 
uh, phrase marker. So it's another token again. So it means that you have to define a very smart logic uh, to understand at the lexical, in, in your lexical analysis, which new lines are actually uh, to be ignored, which new lines are token, and which, wa which one of these tokens is, uh, is uh, the good one for this new line character. Okay? So, so at this point, you may be a bit uh, frightened, so you may want to escape. I don't know, maybe you want to escape, but uh, before that, I do have a quiz for you. Uh, so you know Dash. Dash is a Debian shell, so you're all expert of Dash, right? Uh, and so you can tell me, with no computer, uh, which one of these lines uh, outputs two backslashes to the standard output? So please raise your hand if you think the first one will output, output two backslashes. Don't be shy. Thank you. Uh, the second one? Uh, I don't count. <laughs> okay. The third one? Yes, you're the expert in the room. Um, I won't explain why today, because I don't have one hour. Uh, it doesn't take one hour, but it's a long explanation after all. But uh, yes, you need, you need six backslashes to output two backslashes. Okay? In Dash. Yeah, yeah. It's in POSIX shell, actually. It's, it's compliant with POSIX. In Dash, yes. Not in Bash. Bash... Uh, and and bin echo is n is also uh, not uh, does not have the right uh, behavior with respect to POSIX too, with that respect. Okay, but now imagine that you put a back quote around. Shouldn't change. I mean, it's just uh, running a subshell, right? So what will happen here? Syntax error. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one, it really takes one hour, and we are not really sure how to explain it exactly. So that's what I meant when I said earlier that escaping depends on the nesting of subshell and double quotes. Okay. Nobody wants to leave the room? I mean... Uh, okay. Okay, so I can continue. So I've said earlier that uh, actually, after the lexical analysis, what you get are pre-tokens. And uh, what the grammar needs is tokens. So what you have to do at some point is to take words and uh, promote them to keywords and uh, or to assignment words. But I won't talk about assignment words because I don't have time to do that. Uh, but actually, what I want to say is that this promotion depends on the parsing context. So it's, it's um, maybe clear, uh, it will be clearer with this example. It is not, I'm not the author of this example. Ralph Trannan with his twisted mind dev device this uh, example, which is a bit uh, weird maybe, but uh, it uh, correctly uh, illustrates that uh, a keyword, uh, I mean, something that looks like a keyword can be interpreted as something that is not a keyword depending on its place in the output, okay? So for instance, for here, this one, the first one is, of course, a reserved word. You're starting a, a loop, okay? But this one is just a word that is a part of your uh, sequence on which you are uh, iterating over. Okay, so it means, and, and that's the same for in and for do and so on. That's a syntactically correct program, by the way, you know, yeah, of course, right? So when you are in your lexical analyzer, you have to call the passing context to introspect it, to observe it, to define if you can promote a word into a reserved word. But not all the time. Sometimes some words, some words that are actually, that could be interpreted as reserved words, like else,
cannot appear at some very specific position. Okay, so you have a lot of irregularities in the spec specification, a lot of special corner everywhere in this very dark world of POSIX shell language. So never, never name one of your tool bin else. It will never, a user will never be able to call it. I mean, uh, without the full path. Okay. So it means that in your parser, you will have some ad hoc side conditions everywhere to cope with all the irregularities of the language. But at this point, I see some eyes that are a bit frightened, but not that much. You've seen a lot already in your programmer life. But I have something that is like the, I don't know, the final boss, the, the one that will kill you if you don't protect yourself. So I want to warn you before I show that. So are you prepared for this last, e last example? So the icing of the cake, actually static parsing is undecidable. You can't write a static parser for shell script. Why? This is because of the presence of alias. So alias is like a uh, macro, um, if you want some form of define of macro definition, what you are defining with alias is uh, a word that is substituted by uh, some uh, uh, string just before syntactic an analysis is applied. Okay, so it means in that example that depending on the exit status of foo, this, this uh, script is syntactical syntactically correct or not. That's not your choice. It's Foo's choice. Okay, so you can't decide. So, okay, you will say, ah, it's normal because usually shell scripts are syntactically anali analyzed and evaluated just phrase by phrase and so I'm able to evaluate this program using bash or something like that. But in our case, we really have to be static we can't evaluate scripts, so we can't say if this script is syntactically correct or not. Okay, you are pretty calm. Maybe it's because we are just after the lunch. Uh, but you may wonder at this point if... Uh, uh, so yes, passing depends on evaluation. So at this point, you may wonder if it's even possible to write a shell parser, okay? Um, but actually, uh, of course, that's possible because there are very smart people in, in the world that uh, uh, were able to, um, to tackle this problem. I mean, if you look at the parser of Dash, it's, um, it's 1,600 lines of uncrafted C, character level C. I mean, this guy, they, they, they took the textbook and they use it not to open it and to, l to, to use it, but as a shield. Okay, as a weapon, they don't use the textbook actually as a textbook. They just implement a parser with their bare hands. They are heroes. Okay, the same is true for Bash, with which is using some form of grammar which is totally different from the one of the of the specifications, and also an extra five thousand lines of C. But actually, it's for Bash, which is a, a, um, a larger language than than Shell. Okay, so. What you get is uh, some code like that, okay? So I it's uh, uh, a glimpse of, uh, of the uh, Dash parser, and uh, I don't want you to read it and to understand it, but the idea is that wha what you get is a very uh, low-level parsing uh, code which using bit mask, global variables, uh, uh, character-level parsing, um, and a lot of lot of things, uh, some form of backtracking at some point and so on. So it's really, really impressive to be able to write down this code and to have it correct. I have a deepest respect for this programmer and uh, I have not uh, a brain as large as uh, their brain. So I can't, personally, I can't maintain that kind of code. I can't trust it because I can't maintain it. I can't understand it. My skull is too small. Okay, 
So I have to find a way to write a parser that is POSIX compliant and also simple in some way so that with my little brain I can handle it under its complexity locally piece by pieces, pieces by pieces. And that's why we went back to the books or to arti uh, research article and tried to do some more advanced magic uh, um, in terms of modular key changer for parsing. What we, we do is a variant of the, the standard uh, architecture for parser that, that I've presented already. And um, the idea is that we will use code generators as much as possible because we want high level uh, code as much as possible. And uh, what we will do is to, um, uh, to, 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 to uh, orchestrate the interaction between this, this generated code in such a way that this orchestration can be easily mapped to the specification. Okay, so we have um, an architecture in which we have a prelexer, which is written by some lex specification as usual, which produces pre-tokens, and then we have two modules which interacts um, in a way that the lexer provides tokens to the parser, and the parser is able to provide its state to the lexer for introspection. Um, but what makes this possible? Uh, actually, is the fact that uh, we are using some special technology here. Okay, thank you. Um, um, first of all, we use uh, a, a YAC uh, generator called uh, Menir, uh, which uh, makes it possible to simply take the grammar of the standard and cut, uh, cut and paste it into our code and then build all the complex interactions that have already uh, to deal with the uh, already presented complexity of the parsing outside, uh, around this specification. So we are very proud of this. We are very close to the standard because we start with the specification of the standard. And the key uh, ingredients that makes it work is the fact that we are using a purely functional and incremental parser that helped us use uh, very advanced uh, parsing techniques uh, which are called speculative parsing, longest prefix parf parsing, parameterized lexus, and parser state into introspection. So I, I can't go into the details here, but the idea of speculative parsing is the fact that you uh, don't have a single parser, you have uh, actually many soldiers, and sometimes you take a parser and you, you say, he you ask him to go in the, in the future, in the future to read a little more of the, the input, and eventually, eventually this parser can die, but just before he dies, he sends you by a message to describe what, we, uh, what he has seen, okay? And using this information, you can you can decide what to do in your actual parser. We can do that because we are purely functional. So we are stateless and we share a lot of things between all our different checkpoints in, in the parsing process. Uh, so, so I think I will skip the other one. Uh, so I, I, I can't show you the code today, but what I can show you is uh, the difference between what you get using our generator uh, menir uh, with respect to the standard output that you get with bison for instance S if you use bison what you get if you um, do if you give him uh, uh, a yak specification is um, a code uh, that is basically a function that take a lexa and then execute and when you you give it the control it will execute and consume all the input to produce an entire abstract syntax tree if the input is actually syntactically correct. Okay, you can't interrupt it. With Menir, we have an alternative signature that allows us to, uh, to, uh, to do some interruptible uh, passing 
uh, uh, process. Actually, when you are uh, in um, uh, using a, a parser generated by Menier, what you get is uh, a checkpoint. Okay, when you execute the pars parsing function, you get a checkpoint which corresponds to a single step in the parsing uh, process. And then you can take the state that you get at this point, and you, d you will know what's with a very beautiful uh, uh, sum type, you will know in which case you are in the parsing analysis. So that you can make an interaction, as I've said in the preview, as I've shown you in the preview previous diagrams, between the parser and the lexa, and uh, the lexa can react to each step of the parsing uh, process, so that to, to um, I no, don't know, for instance, promote words into reserved words, if uh, the parser is compatible with that. Uh, okay, so that's the details. I will skip this. So um, what we uh, we get uh, for the moment is uh, a standalone program called Morbig, uh, which is able to uh, turn uh, a shell script into a, a syntax, some syntax tree represented in JSON. It's actually pretty efficient. It, uh, we were able to parse the, the corpus uh, that uh, Ralph described in uh, nine seconds on, uh, on my laptop. Uh, so it's pretty efficient. And uh, so you could say, oh, so you're done. No, we are not done at all. Because there are, of course, a lot of bugs in that uh, parser. I'm pretty sure that we are missing some in correct interpretation of the specification, uh, that uh, there are some incorrect uh, uh, tree construction in the process, and so on and so forth. So we are really uh, uh, inside this uh, journey in error. And what we try to achieve, it's a state in which we will have uh, the specification and the code. And the code will be high level enough uh, that the, um, the mapping between the specification of the code could be explained and shown and documented so that an expert of the specification could say, oh yeah, you did exactly what I was uh, thinking when I wrote this piece of informal human uh, uh, natural language uh, text. So that's okay. Or sometimes, and that's more, pro um, more likely, uh, it will say, oh, no, you, you, you interpret it uh, wrong, okay? So, that we so our goal is to be able to really extract some knowledge to the experts by, confront by being able to explain our code to the expert. And to do that, we have to be high level. So, uh, so that's uh, the end. Uh, I hope that you will not, do s uh, not have too many nightmares tonight. I thank you for your intention, and uh, at some point in June, we will have the first release of, uh, of our tool. So if you are brave enough, try it. Uh, give, us, give us some feedbacks, and uh, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Thank you for the talk. Are there any questions? So thank you for interesting introduction to this. Uh, how does this actually is going to uh, determine or detect this uh, send mail post removal okay. or pre removal? Okay, so that, that's issue? the first. Uh, oh, you want to? Oh, okay. Do it. Uh, okay, that's of course a very good question. So we seem to be, and in fact we are, in fact still quite far from this final goal of being able to find such a bug. So the parser is of course only the first element of our tool chain. And of course, what, what has to be done in the rest of the project is to building on the, um, once we have constructed a abstract or concrete syntax tree of a, of a script, to implement the tool which will do a symbolic execution of the script and construct precisely what the script is, uh, is doing. So all the analysis which is going to happen still has to be done. The parser is doing nothing of this kind. It's just it's just doing a syntactic analysis, and what we found so far with uh, with the parser is, in fact, we found a few few bugs in, uh, in shell scripts, but these would be considered quite quite trivial. <coughs> they are quite 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 trivial, trivial uh, syntactic bugs, 
or, or wrong, or wrong invocations of, of, of commands and we find bugs for them, but these are not the bugs we are, we are aiming at. Of, of course, in the end, we would like to find interesting stuff like the bug I showed before, so interesting semantic bugs of the, of the scripts, but we are still far away from this. Yeah. Okay, far away, but uh, we have started, uh, I mean, uh, we, we already have some idea how to proceed. It's, uh, but no, no tool yet. Uh, not okay. okay. Any other questions? <coughs> I don't Can have actually up? a question. I just have a compliment. This is the mo uh, This was the most sickest shell code I have ever I have seen in years. Vous êtes malade, monsieur. <laughs> Chapeau. Mm -hmm. Malade. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I guess. <laughs> Um, g given how difficult it is to parse shell, should we be using a different language for our post instant, post RM scripts? Yes. <laughs> I think so. But in fact, uh, the question comes up from time to time on the Debian mailing lists. I think yes. Uh, we need something better. But the question is, of course, what? And uh, obviously, uh, the, uh, the question is how can you balance uh, simplicity of the language with the need for express, uh, expressivity in some, in some corner cases. So sometimes you really have to do complicated stuff and then you need a uh, quite powerful language. Uh, and the question is how can you uh, consul reconcile this with the need for something which is really simple and declarative and easy to understand. So it's not obvious. I think, well, so the short answer is yes, we need a better, a better way to write maintainer scripts, but it's far from obvious how this language could, uh, could look like. Could you define a subset of the POSIX, uh, of the POSIX uh, specification that would uh, allow you to, um, to check the, the scripts? Uh, 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 a subset of the specification that uh, is compatible with all the already written uh, maintainer scripts? So wha what we did is some uh, statistical analysis uh, using this parser. Uh, and uh, well, there are some patterns that comes back uh, every time. And uh, there are surely some corner cases of shell scripts that are not used by programmers because they are not all crazy. So it's yes, it's likely that there exists a subset of shells that uh, capture almost all the scripts, and the remaining scripts should be rewritten anyway because they are too uh, complex to be maintainable. For That's instance, so the uh, pathological case that Jan uh, showed to you, the alias which happened conditionally in, in two cases, so this does not occur in Debian in the corpus of Debian maintainer scripts, luckily. <laughs> so we were very glad about that. And in fact, our Morbic parser, as Jan explained, this case it cannot be treated statically. So in fact, the Morbic parser would, would, would refuse such a, such a shell script. Uh, okay, and uh, we used, in fact, the parser to do some stati statistical analysis. Uh, I, we don't have prepared anything to show you the results of this today, but we hope to be able to show it to you at DEPCONF uh, this year in, uh, in, in August, where we will come again, I hope, and uh, present results of the statistical, not static, statistical analysis of the corpus of, of shell scripts. Thank you. Next.